Uh, with a screening, we're usually talking about some kind of a, a triage process. The reason for doing the screening is to kind of get an overall feel of what's going on and then make a decision as to whether or not you should go further with an assessment or an evaluation. So um, it's usually a very brief, okay, you generally most programs are going to administer whatever tool they're using as a screening to every youth that comes in their door. It looks, you know, as I said, it's going to say whether or not you need to go further, whether or not you need to look at things a little closer. Generally speaking, screenings are inexpensive. You're not spending a lot of money, they don't take a lot of time, and generally speaking, again, they can be implemented with folks who don't have clinical degrees and all kinds of special degrees and things like that. So for those of us who are working in diversion, those, a lot of folks have a bachelor's degree and whatever, but they don't necessarily have those clinical skills. So a screening assessment is going to be a good tool for them to use. The assessments, on the other hand, are a little more extensive, take a little bit more time. Generally speaking, you can do a screening and then you can go some of those kids from the screening can go on and do a full assessment. And assessments really help you decide what kind of services to provide for the child, where you should go after you do that assessment. Typically, they're a little bit more expensive. You usually have to pay for the assess for an assessment tool. You know, the Maisie you don't have to pay for. The YLS you do. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot more collecting of data, and generally, you know, there's some kind of specialized training that goes on with an assessment. Do I just hit, or hit enter? I should have had a lesson on this. Okay, good. These are things that you should think about as you're choosing what kind of instrument you're going to use within your program. Time. Nobody has enough time. There's lots and lots of kids that we're all seeing and some of the assessments take some time. It can take, you know, 10 minutes for a screening or you may be able to spend, you know, an hour to two hours doing an assessment. So that's one of the things that you need to think of. How many kids do you see? What, how much staff do you have? How are you going to coordinate all that? The cost, we're all worried about our costs these days, so you need to find an instrument that's going to fit within your budget. <clears throat> um, whether or not you use a paper version or whether or not you have the computer so the kids can do a computer assisted assessment. You know, so those are all things that you need to think about when you're choosing which instrument to use. You also have to look at your staffing. What kind of credentials do the folks have that are coming into your program? Are these uh, folks with uh, bachelor's degrees? Are there folks with associate degrees and experience? What kind of staff do you have that are going to be able to utilize the kind of instrument that you want to bring into your program? And then whether or not there's training involved and how are you going to get that training? Okay, because there are a lot of YLS trainers in the state. Uh, when we first started eight years ago, there weren't any. <laughs> so that was an additional cost. So you have to think about those things. Information sources. What, within the instrument, who are they saying that, where do you get your information from? All assessments, of course, are going to include the youth. But, do you need to have the parent there to complete the assessment? Do you need to have school information? Do you have, where all do you get your information from in order to do the assessment? So if the only thing you can do is talk to the youth, then some of the assessments may, you know, you may not get the most valid scores if the instrument's saying you have to talk to other people. Screening and assessment relationships, you have to make sure that you're telling the youth how this instrument, the results of the screening and the assessment are going to be used. 
okay, within the Juvenile Assessment Center, we tell the kids that the information shared at the Jack will not be shared at court until the judge makes a decision as to found or unfounded. Okay, so if a kid is with us for shoplifting and they're telling us that they're using drugs every day, that information cannot go to court. And we assure the kid that that information will not go to court. If they go to court on the shoplifting, after the judge finds that true, then the information can be shared for treatment purposes. But it cannot be shared to find the child guilty. Does everybody have that worked out within your counties? Because that can be a real sticking point for a lot of folks. And I've had calls from all over the country. I had one from New Jersey where they're saying, how do you do this? How do you do these assessments? They, had, they wanted to use the YLS, and the public defender had to sit in on doing the YLS. And you know what a public defender is going to say. Don't answer that question. <laughs> you know, if you ask the kid about drugs. So it's... It can be very, very sticky, so it sounds like everyone here in Nebraska has already worked that out, and that's really good. Um, you also need to look at, okay, what is the result of the assessment, and how is that going to be used? Some of it may be, you know, not as relevant as other pieces of information and other tools that you have. You're not going to want to pick a tool that's going to give you a psychiatric diagnosis because that's not kind of what you need at this point in time. Okay, remember we're doing uh, screenings and assessment, we're not doing evaluations. Does that make sense? So why do we do these? This takes a lot of time, you know, when you're doing it with every kid. Why do we do it? First of all, and I truly, truly believe this, it reduces bias. You know, we have 15 county attorneys that we work with in the juvenile division here in, county, in, in Douglas County. Each one of them comes in with their own headset, their own bias, their own, you know, who they are. And, you know, if they're just, you know, not doing assessments, not using the assessments to plan treatment, then you're going to find a lot of those biases come into what you're doing in your diversion program. We had one uh, county attorney who's no longer with us, and he's a great guy and a good friend, and I run into him all the time. But Chad, every time, you know, we put the specialist in their case plans, and he rejected them every time because he wanted the kid to go to DCYC for a tour. Now we all know, according to OJJDP, that you know, that kind of scared straight really doesn't amount to much. But he was bringing his, well, if those kids go over and see that, they'll never act this way again. You know, I had to go in and say, Chad, come on, you can't do this. Okay, so really a good reason for using assessments is to kind of reduce that bias so that you are kind of starting out with a uh, level playing field for all the kids and really looking at what they need. Assessments can aid in legal challenges. So it's not Kim Culp saying this kid has to do this. I, I'm directed by this instrument. So if there is ever an opportunity, if anything ever comes up where it's a legal challenge, you have some backing. You're using a validated instrument, a reliable instrument, okay, so that's a lot better. It's, it's going to help um, build better or utilize the resources within your community. What really is needed within your community? So again, you know, when you're doing assessments and screenings on kids, your first uh, concern is for that individual child. But with doing screening and assessments, you do get a lot of data. Okay, so you, over time, you're going to find out what kind of issues these kids are having. You know, ever, oh, these kids, you know, it's drugs and alcohol. Well, after a year or two of doing the assessments, you're finding, you know, that's not as big a problem in the community as we thought it, it was. Really, what the problem is, is peer relations and use of leisure time 
and how they're going to, how they're spending their time. That's not really drugs and alcohol. It's this other. So that way you can tailor your programs within your communities to better meet those needs and not spend so much time doing drug and alcohol education. Not to say that that some kids do in fact need that. Can lead to enhanced public safety. If we're targeting interventions and we're working with kids and what they really truly need, then the overall outcome hopefully is going to be enhanced public safety. And then the program relies on need assessments to determine services offered. And again, that goes back to what really is going on with the kiddos in our community and how do we best meet those needs. I know a lot of folks, you know, have a, a diversion program. You know, at the Juvenile Assessment Center, we refer our kids out. We have a variety of programs. But a lot of folks, there's, there's a program in your community. Well, looking at the assessment, that may help you tweak your program a little bit so that you're really getting to the needs of the kids. Because when you started the program, you thought this was the issue. The assessments and screening are saying, no, mm, this, is, this is a bigger issue. So then how do you tailor your program and what changes do you need to make? Mm. I'm just going to start this out, you know, as you go through and listen to Christy and I talk uh, this morning and Susie this afternoon, just kind of what want you to remember that, you know, assessments aren't infallible, they can go wrong, and so kind of think about this. An assessment instrument, if they're not validated or norm for the population you're working for, with. Okay, so if you uh, pick an instrument that is measuring, you know, three to six-year-olds and the kids who are coming into assessment are 15, 14, 15, you've picked the wrong instrument. So you want to make sure that the instrument that you're using is norm for your population and validated for your popula population. <clears throat> Offenders are assess, then everyone gets the same treatment. Is that going on in any of your communities where you have a diversion program, so the assessment, the kids just go right into that program? No? Good. Uh, errors occur even with the most efficient instruments, you know? We're all human, we do make errors, so we have to make sure that, you know, we do the very best that we can. And then this is a big one, and it kind of goes back to some of the things that uh, Monica was talking about with evidence-based program and organizational development, is that the assessment does not reflect the organizational philosophies. You know? And here, you know, we want to have every youth who can have an opportunity for diversion, we want to give them that opportunity. That's not the case in a lot of other places. People will say, oh, only the kids who, you know, have, have been involved in this crime or that crime or, um, have a chance for diversion. So you really have to make sure that, you know, the two philosophies that I think are important is that every kid gets an assessment and that we are not overusing our treatment and putting low-risk kids into high-end treatment. Okay? And that can be an issue. And I know we have a lot between the specialist and the county attorneys, we have a lot of debate that goes on. And from time to time, and then sometimes it changes, and you don't even realize that it's changing because an incident happened in your community, and everybody's very upset about you know an incident, and the result of that is that people get kind of tough on kids that really aren't a part of that. So that's something that you have to keep in mind, and you have to con continue to think about. <clears throat> 